Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Dr. Joseph Bertino. I'm from Bertino Consulting located in beautiful Schenectady, New York. Our topic today is entitled Pharmacogenetics. What is it? How do I measure it? And what does it mean to me? I'd like to remind the audience that if you have questions during or after the presentation, you can type them into the question box that appears on the screen and uh, they will then appear on my computer screen and I'll, uh, I'll try as best as I can to answer them uh, and I will repeat the question so that everybody knows what the question was. So without further ado, let's uh, start our presentation today and, and uh, our goals and objectives are to review the concepts of pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics to discuss how genetics and the environment affects the activity of drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters, and then to discuss some examples on how pharmacogenetics will lead to individualization of drug therapy, which is also called personalized or individualized medicine. So what is pharmacogenetics? Well, there are some important definitions to consider before we get into that. Uh, more more deeply. Pharmacodynamics is an expression of pharmacokinetics, that is drug effect. Another way to look at pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body. Pharmacokinetics is an expression of pharmacogenetics, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, ADME, or what the body does to the drug. Pharmacogenomics is the study of the hereditary basis for differences in a population's response to a drug. Essentially what pharmacogenomics tells you is that you can't pick your parents. And then pharmacogenetics is the effect of genetics and the environment, including on things including cytochrome P450s, conjugative reactions, transporters, uh, receptor interactions, uh, etc. So I just want to review a few important facts before we uh, get into this a little bit deeper. Um, the human chromosome, as you recall, has 22 chromosome pairs and it's got one pair of sex chromosomes. The functional unit of the genome is called the gene. Only 2% of genes code for proteins. The remainder is structural for DNA, so it sort of holds the DNA together. The entire genome is composed of 3 billion DNA pairs with about 30,000 protein coding genes. And DNA sequence of a pair of genes varies between each individual gene in that pair. In pharmacogenetics and genomics, we talk about something called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And these account for sequence variation between people. And there's about one SNP per 1,000 base pairs of DNA. 1% 1 of SNPs affect protein coding region of the DNA sequence. SNPs change the way the protein is made. They can also be stop codons. They can result in functional, functionally inactive protein or reduced activity protein. And you can also see gene deletion where no protein is made. Essentially what SNPs do is they tell the body its blueprint. So if you have uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism for a certain characteristic, um, we can identify that SNP and say, okay, this person has this characteristic. And it doesn't just have to be a transporter, a drug metabolizing enzyme, or a receptor. Uh, it can be a physical characteristic, for example. So the chromosome is the largest unit. The gene is the next unit. Alleles code for a gene. Different alleles determine different characteristics. And, and uh, allele is one member of a pair that makes up a gene. So two, two of the same alleles are considered homozygous. That means one allele on each part of a pair of chromosomes two different alleles are considered heterozygous. And remember, you get one allele from mom and one allele from dad. 
just a little bit in terms of uh, the history of pharmacogenetics, and uh, and it turns out that pharmacogenetics. Uh, uh, this is this is one part of a slide, but it actually goes way back to Pythagoras, who uh, first described uh, the disease favism. And favism, uh, some of you may may know, is seen in people of Mediterranean descent when they eat fava beans, uh, they can get a hemolytic anemia. Uh, so while the concept of pharmacogenetics is, is centuries old, um, the term pharmacogenetics was only coined in the late 1950s, 1959 uh, to, be, to be exact. Um, and our knowledge of pharmacogenetics continues to grow because of all the uh, great new tools that we have in the laboratory to try to uh, uh, to try to look at different things. So how about pharmacogenetics and evolution? Well, one of the things that we think about is something called plant-animal warfare. And plant-animal warfare explains the variety of enzymes that are capable of destroying naturally occurring toxins. Essentially what this means is that many centuries ago when people went out and they were hunters and gatherers and they ate certain things out in the wild, uh, some of the toxins in those, in those wild fruits and vegetables made the individual sick. But over many generations, the individual developed uh, a system to detoxify some of the things in those uh, fruits and vegetables so that they weren't toxic anymore. Um, you know, so so that, that's what we describe as plant animal warfare. Um, now, unfortunately, um, no one has discovered um, an enzyme that detoxifies, for example, my mother-in-law's cooking. Uh, it's still uh, very toxic. Um, we also talk about person-to-person -person variability in pharmacogenetics, and, and this is genetic distances. And whether you're a, a student of uh, the theory of evolution or uh, creationism or whatever, at some point in time, uh, human beings were genetically very similar in terms of their genetic code. But over over many generations, many centuries, we started to see this genetic distance. And this is due to um, mutations, uh, allelic variants. And allelic variants have a, a large, have a high frequency uh, due to mutation. So over uh, the course of, um, you know, the existence of man, uh, we've gone from having the same DNA to having a lot of uh, variability in our DNA. And that's what makes us all individual. So next I want to talk about uh, specifically some drug metabolizing enzymes that in pharmacogenetics and genomics we know a lot about. Uh, so let's start out with the phase one reactions, which is the cytochrome P450 system. Um, and cytochrome P450 enzymes, if you look at this little schematic that I've shown here on the screen, the liver is uh, the major source of cytochrome P450 enzymes, but in fact, Cytochrome P450 enzymes are found in most organs of the body. Uh, they are called the phase one oxidative enzymes. Um, and so I think it's, it, the important point here is that while the liver is the most highly metabolic organ in the body, that uh, cytochrome P450 enzymes are found throughout the body and can affect uh, drug metabolism, drug response. Uh, not just in the liver, not just by the liver converting them, but by other organs. Now there is a standard system of terminology for cytochrome P450 enzymes, and that's shown up here on the screen. And so I'm using the example of CYP 2C9 star 1 star 2. So let's just go through this. All caps CYP. This indicates the P450 for all mammalian species. Now it's not just mammals that have cytochrome P450s, um, other, other uh, uh, genus and species have, have uh, cytochrome P450s, so, but all caps indicates mammalian. The next number, two, is the family. There are 17 families that have been described. 14 of them have been described in humans. The next letter is C. This is the subfamily. 42 subfamilies have been described in humans. The next number, 9, is the enzyme or the gene where, uh, where this is found. And, and there are 55 genes and 29 pseudogenes that have been described in humans where cytochrome P450 
P450s can be found. And then finally, star 1, star 2 is the allele pattern. Remember, you get one from mom and one from dad. Traditionally, what we talk about is that the star 1 allele is also called the wild type allele. It is the most common allele in the population. So sometimes when you're reading an article rather than seeing star 1, uh, you will see WT, wild type. Um, but that actually is not part of the standard terminology. The standard terminology is uh, to use a numeric system. So star 1 generally is the most common allele, and it generally it's the active allele. Uh, all the other alleles, some can be active, some can be of reduced activity, and some can be uh, null alleles or, or alleles that are inactive. Uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit more about that in, in just a couple of minutes. So what do the cytochrome P450s do? Well, they metabolize drugs throughout the body. They adapt the organism to the environment. We talked about, again, plant-animal warfare. These enzymes that were uh, developed over many centuries in man originally weren't meant to be drug metabolizing enzymes, but today we recognize them commonly as drug metabolizing enzymes, at least in clinical pharmacology we do. Uh, cytochrome P450s can take drugs that are not active and they can activate them. So for example, uh, drugs such as prednisone, which are not uh, active when it's given in its, in its uh, tablet form, but it's activated to prednisolone in the body. That's called a prodrug. Uh, cytochrome P450s can take a drug that is normally already active and convert it into another drug that might be more active, less active, uh, you know, about the same. Uh, an example would be procainamide, which is an antiarrhythmic. It's converted in the body uh, to an acetylprocainamide, uh, which has less activity but still has some antiarrhythmic activity. Cytochrome P450s also detoxify substances, and they activate non-toxic substances into toxic substances. So a good example here of the latter would be um, taking something that's a procarcinogen and converting it into a carcinogen. And a good example is uh, something in cigarette smoke, which is uh, not cancer-causing, but then is converted in the body into a cancer-causing substance. Now we talk about drug metabolism and cytochrome P450 enzymes. Um, there are many, many minor cytochrome P450 enzymes that metabolize drugs, but this slide really only shows the um, major drug metabolizing enzymes that, uh, that are involved in drug metabolism. And it's important to keep in mind that not all drugs are metabolized. Some are eliminated from the body unchanged. And not all drugs that are metabolized are metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes. But you can see in this slide, uh, the biggest piece of the pie here is with the cytochrome P450 3A group. And this is 3A4, 3A5. There's also two other minor 3As, 3A7, 3A43. Normally, we don't talk about just 3A4 anymore because um, this cytochrome P450 group tends to metabolize the same substrate, so it's really cytochrome P453A isozymes rather than just 3A4. You can see here that the 2s, 2D6, 2C19, 2C89, 2E1, 2B6, and 2A6 actually make up a bigger portion uh, of SIPs that metabolize drugs. And then we've got the 1A1, 1A2 here, which is a smaller portion. And once again, if I tried to show every single enzyme on this pie chart, uh, there are little tiny pieces of pie, uh, and we probably wouldn't be able to read most of it. There are other cytochrome P450s, though, that are involved, and many drugs are metabolized by more than one cytochrome P450. Another thing that um, is important when we talk about what is pharmacogenetics and genomics is to think about the intersubject variability in drug metabolizing enzymes. Um, and, and really what we mean here is that the degree of enzyme activity is different between individuals. Uh, and this is due to either genetics or the environment or both. Um, we use the term genetic polymorphism. And what this means is that there is a variable gene expression found in at least 1% of the population. So what's a concrete example of genetic polymorphism? Well, 
How many of our audience members can roll their tongue? Everybody, roll your tongue. If you, in, in a, most populations, when I ask that question, more people cannot roll their, excuse me, less people cannot roll their tongue, more people can roll their tongue, but at least 1% of people in, in, in a group usually cannot do it. And those are the people that we would call uh, having experienced genetic polymorphism. Those are the, they're the minority people. In the, in the group. Um, for drug metabolizing enzymes, numerous metabolizing enzymes show genetic polymorphism. Some of the ones that are clinically significant are CYP2C9, 2C19, 2B6, and 2D6. All of these things explain uh, intersubject variability in drug metabolizing enzymes through genetics. Uh, also, we, we, we sometimes call this the gene dose effect, and I'll show you some, a slide on that a little bit later. So just to review some of the variability in cytochrome P450 activity, and this is some data that our lab has generated over the years in humans. Um, and you can see four major CYP enzymes shown in this slide. CYP1A2, you can see that the intersubject, so the between person, and the intrasubject, within person variability is, is actually pretty modest, about 20%. Uh, for CYP2D6, which is an enzyme that shows genetic polymorphism, you can see that the intra-subject variability and the intersubject variability are, are somewhat different. The intersubject variability is mediated through the gene dose effect. And as I'll show you on a cartoon in a minute, um, this means some people have very active cytochrome P452D6 and some people have uh, inactive enzyme, or they don't make enzyme at all, or the enzyme they make just doesn't metabolize drugs. Intrasubject variability of CYP2D6 is very interesting because there's a wide range of day-to-day -day variability with a, about a 35% median. But you can see that some people have 135% uh, intraday variability, and we generally don't know why that is, why people's activity of that enzyme will vary from day to day. But what we do know is that if there's big swings from day to day, it can affect drug response, drug metabolism, etc. Cytochrome P453A isozymes, the group of CYP3As, the intrasubject variability um, is, uh, is about 10%. Um, the intersubject variability um, for uh, if you're not considering gut CYP3A, is about twofold. But if you consider gut CYP3A, uh, there's between a five and seven-fold difference uh, in the intersubject variability. So that, that's, that can be pretty, pretty impressive. Um, for CYP2C19, which is another of the CYPs that shows genetic polymorphism, the intra-individual variability is about 20% in extensive metabolizers, but the inter-individual variability, once again, is mediated through the gene dose effect. There is uh, a couple of active alleles that code for good activity of the enzyme, and there are many alleles that code for no activity of the enzyme. So it really depends on your genetics in this case, in terms of the person-to-person -person variability in the activity of this enzyme. Really what I want you to go away with is that the activity of these enzymes can vary from person to person and can vary within the person, and that's all going to um, play a role when you're doing drug studies, particularly pharmacokinetic studies or even clinical trials. And certainly in the clinic when you're treating patients with diseases with drugs, uh, you can see varying effects uh, that can change from person to person or from day to day. And uh, you're going to walk away hearing me say once or twice that that means one dose is not right for everybody. Now the phase two enzymes are the conjugative enzymes. These can show genetic polymorphism. We know quite a bit less about these enzymes than we do about the uh, cytochrome P450s, but some of the enzymes in this group include uh, UDP glucuronosyl transferase, uh, which includes the UGTs and the glucuronidate compounds, glutathione S transferase, sulfonotransferase, methyltransferase, epoxide hydroxylases, and N acetyltransferase or NET. Um, all of these uh, conjugative enzymes, once again, what they do is they add a group to a drug to make it uh, more water-soluble so it can be eliminated from the body. Now, there are also are things called drug transporters. And drug transporters 
only do one of two things. They either move things into tissues or they move things out of tissues or they keep things out of tissues. Um, and the ones that, um, that, were, were, that we feel are important ones are PGP or P-glycoprotein. Uh, this is an efflux transporter. For example, in the gut, P-glycoprotein keeps drugs from moving from the gut into the systemic circulation. Um, there are uh, organic anion and organic cation transport proteins, OATP, OCTP. These are influx transporters. They help to move drugs uh, into, uh, into organs. Uh, these transporters can also show genetic polymorphism, so they can show genetic differences from person to person. We know quite a bit less about whether or not they show day-to-day -day variability within individuals. So that's what pharmacogenetics and genomics is. Let's talk about how do I measure. Well, essentially there are two ways to investigate the activity of drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters. Um, one way is called genotyping. Genotyping essentially investigates an individual's genetic code looking for those variant alleles. So normally people don't look for the wild type alleles. They just assume that if they find variant alleles, um, if they took an individual and they were looking at a specific enzyme and they found two variant alleles, that they would find no wild type alleles. And that, that's generally a good rule of thumb. Um, but you can, um, you can genotype for the wild type alleles and, and really you know, say, well, this person has one wild type allele one variant allele. Um, genotyping uses a PCR-based test, and essentially what it'll do is it'll take DNA from a couple of sources. Uh, sometimes peripheral leukocytes is used. We might draw a tube of blood, spin down the blood, get the buffy coat, the white blood cells, and then we can extract the DNA from those white blood cells. Um, but you can use any other DNA source. Uh, there, there are commercial companies out there that market genotyping to, to uh, consumers, and they will send a kit where you can do a swish and spit and get buccal mucosal cells. You just take a little Listerine or something and swish it around your mouth, spit it into a, uh, into a little uh, container, close it up, send it away, and they can extract DNA from, uh, from the buccal mucosal cells. So everything I've learned about DNA and genotyping, I learned from watching CSI. And uh, so what, what we know is, is that um, genotyping is 100% specific and 80% sensitive. The place where genotyping falls down is when um, we use things like gene chips, commercially available genotyping tools uh, that cannot possibly genotype for every single allele pattern. And sometimes we come up with confusing patterns. And, uh, in some of those instances, the best way to determine what those patterns really are is to do a, a genotyping by hand, which is much more time consuming as you might guess. But gene chips, think like Ampli chips, for example, have really revolutionized the way that we can do genotyping. And for most people, um, and for most clinical trials, that will, be, that will be good enough. The other way to investigate activity of drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters is to do phenotyping. And phenotyping investigates the manifestation of genetic code differences. And those differences, again, can be due to uh, drugs, the environment, diet, disease, other things. Phenotyping is a pharmacologic test using a safe enzyme-specific drug marker that can be easily quantitated in the urine or the blood, for example. And we also call this a, a drug probe. Uh, that probe really does have to be specific and uh, what we do is when we give the drug probe uh, whatever we're measuring in the urine or blood, the analytical technique has to be very specific and good, and the measure or the biomarker that we're looking at to try to assess activity has to be very specific and valid. So all of these things have to be validated. So somebody can't say, uh, I decided I'm going to use this drug to measure this enzyme activity and there's no data to support that in the literature. That's an unvalidated probe, and most regulatory agencies aren't going to accept that, that sort of data. 
So how do genetics and genotype line up? Well, this slide shows the uh, molecular mechanisms of altered drug metabolism. And what you can see is uh, over here on the, in the middle, um, we've got people with multiple genes. And, and we've got the people here in the middle that are normal. They have two active alleles, one from mom and one from dad. Um, those people can have um, alleles that um, make enzyme that show altered substrate specificity. So that means that the substrate doesn't bind as well to the drug metabolizing enzyme. Or they can have alleles that produce an unstable enzyme and therefore uh, these individuals don't um, metabolize drugs at the same rate as the normal people. Over on this side we've got these people over here that have deleted genes, gene deletions. Uh, they make no enzyme, they can't metabolize drugs via uh, that route of administration. That they can't metabolize the drugs via that cytochrome P450. And these people over here on the right side are people that have single genes. And they, these people have stacks of alleles. Rather than having one from mom and one from dad, they might get one from mom and six from dad. And these are the people who make lots and lots of the enzyme in question. And they metabolize drugs at a very high rate of speed. Clinically, these are the people that we treat with a drug. Uh, we use a standard dose. They come in, uh, they're taking their drug, they're not getting a therapeutic response, and we say, are you taking your drug? And they say, yes, doc, I'm taking my drug. And you're always questioning their compliance, and it turns out it's not a matter of noncompliance. It's really a matter of the fact that they're just metabolizing dr the drug so rapidly that they don't get a pharmacologic effect. Now, there also is some ethnic evidence of genetic variation in cytochrome P450 drug metabolizing enzymes. And once again, what this means is different patients need different doses. So let me give you some examples here. Uh, for example, cytochrome P452C19, if you have the star 2 or the star 3 allele, um, remember star 1 is the wild type, that's normal activity. Star 2 or star 3 are null alleles. You don't make any enzyme if you have either two of these, two of these, or one of each star two of, and one star three, about 13 to 20 percent of Asians, and that's Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese, where most of this data has been generated, uh, have two of these alleles, and these people are really poor metabolizers. These people are very interesting, so they need reduced uh, amounts of drug to get the same pharmacologic effect that people with a wild type allele would need. Uh, cytochrome P452D6, the star 2XN. This is the people that have the stacks of alleles. So they, the star 2 is an active allele for CYP2D6, and N is the number of alleles in the stack. And when you look at Ethiopians and Saudis, about 30% of these people have these stacks of alleles. And once again, these are the people that need huge doses, four, five, six times the normal dose to get a pharmacologic effect. The CYP2D6 star 10 allele, it's a reduced activity allele. The star 17 allele is a reduced activity. You can see about 70% of Asians, again, Koreans, Chinese, Japanese, most of this data generated in. And for the star 17 allele, about 5% of African Americans have these reduced activity alleles, and they don't metabolize drugs by these pathways as well as uh, individuals that have the wild type allele. CYP2A6 gene deletion. Um, CYP2A6 is interesting and important because it metabolizes nicotine. Uh, about 15% of Asians have this gene deletion, and these people are very sensitive to nicotine. Uh, but they also get a, a big buildup of nicotine, and they probably get a pharmacodynamic tolerance in the brain to it over time. Um, now the tobacco companies know about uh, 2A6 gene deletion and can manipulate the amount of nicotine in their cigarettes based on genetics. And then CYP2B6, um, this is an, an important uh, cytochrome P450 for metabolizing certain antiretrovirals like efavirenz, uh, which is used to treat HIV infections. Uh, African Americans tend to have um, the alleles that code for reduced activity more commonly than Caucasians. And when you start drugs like efavirenz in a population of African Americans, we see much greater central nervous system side effects in the first two to three weeks of therapy than we would in a Caucasian population. So the implications of pharmacogenomics then is that in the population, genetics determines drug metabolizing and transporter activity. 
Most people are what we call normal. They have normal activity. Uh, these people technically are called extensive metabolizers. Why didn't we call them normal metabolizers? Gee, I don't know. The people uh, 40 years ago came up with this term. Uh, these are the people that you can use standard drug dosing regimens on. Some individuals will have much higher activity in the population. These people are called ultra-rapid metabolizers. Those are the people that need bigger doses. Some individuals will have significantly reduced activity, but they still have some drug metabolizing enzyme activity. These are people that are called intermediate metabolizers. Some individuals will have little or no activity, and these are people that are called poor metabolizers. So these guys need reduced doses, but the PMs need greatly reduced doses. But really, rather than these categories in the population, phenotype is really more of a continuum. And um, the other thing about this is that I'm describing an enzyme that shows genetic polymorphism here. But in general, for all cytochrome P450s, phenotype is more of a continuum. Now, sometimes we, we get fooled with pharmacogenetic testing. And so I want to show you some data from one of our studies where we use the drug omeprazole, which many of you are familiar with. Some of you may be taking it. Uh, you know that it is an over-the-counter proton pump inhibitor suppresses gastric acid production. It's useful for lots of different uh, GI conditions. And we use omeprazole to phenotype people for cytochrome P452C19 activity. And what we do is we give people one dose of omeprazole, and we look at plasma concentrations, and we get a metabolic ratio of the parent drug, omeprazole, to the, um, to the metabolite that is formed by... Uh, cytochrome P452C19. So in this study that we did, we took 10 females and 10 males, and we genotyped them um, to make sure that they were at least uh, intermediate metabolizers, or preferably extensive metabolizers. And we gave these people omeprazole at six different times in two-week periods. And this is a conglomerate of the data. And what you can see here is that females have a much lower metabolic ratio than males, suggesting in this case that this is parent drug divided by metabolite, that females have much more metabolic activity than men do for cytochrome P450. So we said, aha, there's a sex difference, right? You all know it's sex and not gender because you can change your gender, but you can't change your sex. Um, but it turns out that when we looked at the genotype for men and women, all the females were star one, star one. So they all had two wild type alleles. They made lots of enzymes. In the male group, we had a few males that were star one, star two. So they had one active allele and one no activity allele. So that when we looked at the males that were just star one, star one, so genetically they were the same as females, you can see there was no difference in metabolic ratio, suggesting that this was not a sex difference. But it was what we call a gene dose effect. Genetics would affect the dose uh, of omeprazole in terms of CYP2C19 activity. So how else do we do phenotyping? Can we phenotype for more than uh, one enzyme simultaneously? And the answer is yes. Um, this is an example of uh, a cocktail that we developed called the Cooperstown 5 plus 1 cocktail. And what we do is we use caffeine uh, to phenotype for CYP1A2 activity. Um, it's about the same amount of caffeine as in a cup of uh, Starbucks coffee, strong coffee. Dextromethorphan, which you know is an over-the-counter cough suppressant, we use to phenotype for CYP2D6. Midazolam, we use orally and or IV um, to, uh, to uh, phenotype for the cytochrome P453A isozyme group. Omeprazole, we use by mouth to, to phenotype for CYP2C19. And then we use a dose of 10 milligrams of warfarin plus 10 milligrams of vitamin K to phenotype for CYP2C9. And these five CYP enzymes basically metabolize about 95% of all the drugs that are metabolized by the cytochrome P450s. We give the vitamin K with the warfarin in this case to prevent the pharmacodynamic effects of anticoagulation. We have validated that when we give vitamin K with warfarin, it does not affect the pharmacokinetics of warfarin, and that's an important thing to do. You need to validate those things before you can really use these as appropriate probes. 
So when we look at phenotype in a population, once again, quite often we'll find two distinct populations. When we look at the metabolic ratio of the probe drug, remember we said genetic polymorphism meant the prevalence of at least 1%. So in this slide you can see we phenotyped a group of people. Uh, for an enzyme, most people fall into this mode, but some people fall into this mode over here. Two distinct populations here shows genetic polymorphism, but once again, Phenotype is a continuum. If you phenotype hundreds or thousands of people, you'd get one big curve with a few people down at this end and a few people down at this end showing different metabolic activity. When we try to correlate phenotype and genotype, what you can see in this slide here is a correlation between phenotype and genotype. The x-axis shows increasing enzyme activity with, uh, with this ratio or with this biomarker that we're looking at. Down at this end, we have poor metabolizers. These are people that have either one slightly active allele and one inactive, or they've got two inactive alleles, so they don't make much enzyme or any. You've got this group of people here, which are intermediate metabolizers. They have uh, maybe two alleles that are only so-so in terms of producing enzyme. Uh, we've got this group of people, most people, that fall into the middle, the extensive metabolizers, they have either two active alleles or one active and one reduced activity allele. And then over here we've got the people that have one active allele from mom and maybe two active alleles from dad. These are the people with the stacks of alleles. They're called ultra-rapid metabolizers. These are the people with the greatest activity. So this is how we correlate phenotype with genotype. Now there are Remember we said that pharmacogenetics talks about genetics and environment. There are other exogenous factors that will affect drug metabolizing and transporter activity. Diet can have a big effect. Certain foods, certain things like fruit juices can have effect on drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters. That's why uh, pretty much in any hospital in the U.S. you go into, you won't see patients uh, on the hospital wards being offered grapefruit juice anymore because there are some significant grapefruit juice, drug metabolism, and transporter interactions. Uh, concurrent drug therapy can have a big effect. Pollution, uh, concurrent other diseases such as infectious diseases. Diseases where you have inflammation and you get generation of cytokines. Cytokines we know can suppress cytochrome P450 activity. We're not sure about transporter activity, but a patient can actually look like they have a lot less activity during an infection and as they get better their activity of their enzymes can increase and therefore their dose, their exposure to a drug can decrease. Uh, sex differences. Well, yeah, they probably exist. For example, for cytochrome P453A isozymes, uh, women tend to have greater activity than men, but clinically they're of questionable importance. Uh, menstrual cycle differences. We've done a lot of work looking at the follicular and luteal phases of the menstrual cycle. Um, we really haven't found differences in, during the menstrual cycle looking at at least those two phases. Uh, age, uh, I think a common misconception is, is that as you get older, you metabolize drugs slower. That may or may not be true. We know in the first year of life that uh, from the time of birth to age one, that drug metabolizing enzyme activity matures over that time. But by age one, uh, children have reached sort of their adult level of activity of drug metabolizing enzymes. So what does this mean to me? Well, the implication of pharmacogenetic variability affects these things that we think about. First of all, drug dosing needs individualization. And any of you that are familiar with the new product label for warfarin, um, if you take a look at it, there actually are very specific recommendations for maintenance doses of warfarin based on uh, a couple of different genotypes that people can look at. Um, so that, once again, the old days of using one dose for every human being in the world really is uh, uh, not accurate in many instances. Uh, drug dosing does need to be individualized. Pharmacogenetics can also help us predict toxic side effects and therapeutic effects. Um, and then the question comes up, can pharmacogenetics help us to predict drug interactions? So I want to talk about that for a minute, the clinical implications of pharmacogenetics and drug-drug interactions. Um, 
you know, and the real story on drug-drug interactions is that one can only qualitatively predict drug-drug interactions. You can say, yes, it will occur, no, it may not occur. But because of the pharmacokinetic variability, generally it results in an inability to quantitate drug-drug interactions. And this makes clinicians crazy because, you know, when you're rounding with a team and they have a patient on drug A and they want to add drug B and there's a known drug interaction, the question to the clinical pharmacologist always is, how much should I reduce the dose of drug A by? And the answer is, I don't know, because each individual uh, will, will vary. And so you can look references up in, you know, Micrometics or Hippocrates or whatever uh, that says, you know, reduce the dose of drug A by 35%, but probably most of the time you're going to be wrong more often than you're going to be right. Drug-drug interactions may not occur in some patients, so I'm going to show you some data on that in a minute. Combinations of drugs that induce and inhibit drug metabolizing enzymes or transporters will cause unpredictable changes. Um, remember that induction means greater activity, and inhibition means lesser activity. So patient response and therapeutic drug monitoring, if applicable and available, uh, can be useful. So drugs that are metabolized will show significant variability in patient exposure. And this is due to intersubject variability in enzyme activity, intrasubject variability, so within person variability, day-to-day -day variability, and transporter variability. Subjects with little or no enzyme activity will not have drug-drug interactions. So the effect of genetics on drug-drug interactions is that People with high drug metabolizing enzyme activity are at greater risk for drug-drug interactions, particularly inhibitory interactions, because they've got more enzyme there to inhibit. Subjects with no drug metabolizing enzyme activity are at no risk for drug-drug interactions because there's no enzyme to inhibit. Enzyme inducers can only induce drug metabolizing enzymes if the genetic potential is present in the person to make drug metabolizing enzymes. So if the person's genetic code codes for making no enzyme, you can give an enzyme inducer and you won't induce enzymes because they don't have the genetic code to turn on to make the enzyme. Uh, inducers are mediated through receptors on DNA, and, that, and that's why. No genetic code means no induction. So let me show you some data on inhibition, at least to try to convince you that no enzyme, no interaction. Uh, this is some data uh, from a few years ago where an author took two groups of individuals and he genotyped these people for cytochrome P452D6. And his two groups were those with extensive metabolizers that made CYP2D6 that metabolized drugs and poor metabolizers. They didn't make any CYP2D6. And what he did was he gave these individuals a dose of venlafaxine. And venlafaxine is a uh, is a, an antidepressant, a second generation antidepressant that is used, and it is a racemic mixture. Most drugs we use are not racemic mixtures, only about a third of them are, but this one is. And it's got an SNR isomer, and both are metabolized by CYP2D6. And what you can see is that after a single dose of venlafaxine, looking at the RNS isomer and the extensive metabolizer and the poor metabolizers, you can see the poor metabolizers had much greater exposure than the extensive metabolizers. And that's what you'd expect from a CYP2D6 metabolized drug in EMs, extensive metabolizers, versus PMs, poor metabolizers. Now what this author did then was he gave both of these groups a number of days of quinidine. And quinidine is the most potent uh, in vivo cytochrome P450 2D6 inhibitor but quinidine is not metabolized by cytochrome P452D6. And I think that's a common misconception. Most people think that in order for an enzyme to, to inhibit activity, uh, it has to be metabolized by that enzyme, and that is not necessarily the case. After he gave these individuals a few days of quinidine, he then gave them another dose of venlafaxine. And what you can see in the extensive metabolizers who started out with lots of enzyme, there is a 4 to 12 fold increase in the exposure to venlafaxine in a single dose when it was given with quinidine. In poor metabolizers, however, there was no increase. The poor metabolizers had no enzyme to inhibit, so their exposure did not go up when they were given quinidine and then redosed with venlafaxine. So the takeaway message is no enzyme, no inhibition.
That means that drug interactions will not necessarily occur in everyone. So how are we using pharmacogenomics to treat patients? Well, currently, according to label, there are five drugs where genetic testing is suggested or will be suggested soon. Uh, for warfarin, which you know is an anticoagulant, a blood thinner, um, that is used in about 3 million people in the U.S. each year, the recommendation is to genotype for CYP2C9 and this uh, V-Core, V-K-O-R-1-C, which is the vitamin K receptor. And warfarin interacts with that receptor to uh, reduce the production of coagulation factors. And once again, if you look at the product label for warfarin, you will see dosing recommendations based on genotype for CYP2C9 and V-Core. Adamoxetine, which is used for ADHD, uh, that is a drug where genotyping for cytochrome P450 2D6, which metabolizes this drug, um, is suggested. 6 mercapidopurine or azathioprine, um, which is metabolized by thiopurine methyltransferase, and this drug is used in acute lymphocytic leukemia in children, also used in a number of the inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, and people that have uh, low activity of TPMT cannot metabolize these drugs well, and they can end up with significant toxicity, bone marrow toxicity. Uh, tamoxifen, which uh, some of you may read in the paper today, the results of the STAR study, which is tamoxifen versus raloxifen for breast cancer prevention, uh, which is a study we have participated in. Tamoxifen is not active. It is converted in the body by cytochrome P452D6 into uh, endoxifen, uh, that is the active substrate. And so women that have low activity of CYP2D6 or are taking drugs like some of the antidepressants like sertraline, which reduce CYP2D6 activity, may not have therapeutic effect with tamoxifen. And abacavir, which is an antiretroviral, an HIV drug, uh, it's recommended that patients be genotyped for human leukocyte antigen B star 5701 because you can see a hypersensitivity reaction occur that is life-threatening in people that are given a back of ear that have uh, this allele. Uh, this is the uh, warfarin label that was approved uh, just a couple of months ago. Um, and you can see here this is the expected range of therapeutic doses based on CYP2C9 and V-Core uh, genotypes. And, and uh, we'll see uh, whether or not this reduces the uh, incidence of, uh, of bleeding uh, adverse events with warfarin. Uh, once again, just newly available a couple of months ago. So with that, that's, that's pretty much the end of the formal talk. I, I want to go through two examples and ask you that if you have questions, uh, please type them in the little box in the uh, lower right-hand side of the screen, and I'll be happy to answer them. But while I'm waiting on those questions, let's go through a couple of examples. Uh, this one is omeprazole, which you know is the old purple pill, and diazepam, which is also known as Valium. Uh, you know that diazepam is a benzodiazepine sedative. Omeprazole is used in um, the treatment of GERD, and it's metabolized by CYP2C19. Omeprazole inhibits its own metabolism. After one week of combination therapy, Caucasian patients require a 50% decrease in diazepam dose with concurrent omeprazole. Asians require a 25% decrease in diazepam dose after a week of combination therapy. Why the difference? And the answer is because of genetics. Um, we know that, um, that uh, certain groups of Asians have less cytochrome P452C19 activity. And what you can see in the graph here is that, uh, is that in the Caucasian patients who have uh, much higher 2C19 activity, uh, you need to decrease, you see a decrease in diazepam clearance with omeprazole versus the Asian patients where you see less of a decrease because they have less CYP2C19 activity. Less enzyme means less enzyme to inhibit less drug-drug interaction. Here's another example. Three drug regimen is therapy of choice for HIV infection, heart therapy. Not uncommonly still protease inhibitors are still a very active group of drugs for treating HIV infection. We know that continued viral suppression is related to adequate drug exposure. And we know that the protease inhibitors are metabolized by cytochrome P453A. 
So we had a, a patient, a 24-year-old Hispanic male, who was, uh, had HIV. We started on heart therapy, uh, and he was started back when we saw him with indinavir. Most people don't start with indinavir anymore, but back then we did. Um, he had a very good response. He's on three-drug therapy. He, uh, his viral load dropped from greater than 100,000 copies to less than 50 copies per mil, so really a terrific response to therapy. Um, the patient was depressed. He did a little bit of internet searching and started himself on St. John's wort that he bought at a GNC or a drugstore. And uh, when we saw him four weeks later after he started the St. John's wort, his viral load had gone from less than 50 copies to 50,000 copies. And we phenotyped his HIV uh, virus, and it showed indivir resistance. So the question was, why? And the answer is, uh, because St. John's wort is a cytochrome P453A inducing agent, and indinavir is metabolized by cytochrome P453A. Uh, and in this study from over about 10 years ago now, Steve Piscatelli published, he looked at eight healthy subjects who were given indinavir alone, and then they were given St. John's wort for two weeks, and then another dose of indinavir. And what you can see is that St. John's wort reduced indinavir exposure by an average of about almost 60%. So this person got uh, viral resistance and got uh, increased HIV uh, viral load because he self-treated himself with, um, with an enzyme inducer. So I see some questions starting to roll in. I'm just, this is our last slide. There are greater than 25 hepatic cytochrome P450 enzymes that are, have been identified in man to date. Efficacy may be due to rapid metabolism and extensive metabolizers or inadequate metabolic conversion in poor metabolizers uh, can determine efficacy. Toxicity may be due to accumulation of drug and poor metabolizers who are given standard medication doses. Uh, morbidity due to drug interactions may be avoided with the knowledge of specific drug metabolizing enzymes involved. And every branch of medicine is affected by pharmacogenetics and genomics, and so uh, it's, we're going to be hearing a whole lot more about this, particularly in drug development. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I see that we've got a number of questions. Let me repeat them first, and I will uh, try to answer these. Um, clopidogrel, the clopidogrel label was also recently changed, uh, same as tamoxifen, a prodrug, and the answer is yes, and I need to update my slide. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, but uh, clopidogrel is a prodrug. It is not active. It is activated uh, a number of ways, but one of the ways is through cytochrome P452C19. Uh, people who are 2C19 poor metabolizers are those that are taking certain proton pump inhibitors. And unfortunately, the data right now is only clear for omeprazole, which is over-the-counter uh, Prilosec, uh, and as omeprazole, which is the new purple pill, Nexium. And remember that Nexium and Prilosec are basically very, they're kissing cousins, um, and, and you can use the cheaper one, um, that um, those drugs suppress 2C19 activity and therefore uh, potentially can uh, interfere with the metabolism of clopidogrel to the active, uh, active uh, anti-platelet substance. So um, yes, you're absolutely right. And you should be cautious in avoiding um, the use of proton pump inhibitors with clopidogrel, at least omeprazole and esomeprazole. Um, we're starting to see trickles of other data with other PPIs that show that they may interfere with clopidogrel also, but currently the strongest data is, is with omeprazole and esomeprazole. And it's because they suppress 2C19 activity. Um, next question, can, can you discuss recent examples of pharmacogenetics and response? Um, and once again, I would point out to you the examples that, um, that um, I put into the, the slide set. Uh, clopidogrel, which someone just pointed out, is a very good example. Um, warfarin certainly is a good example. Um, I think we're going to see the tamoxifen label uh, redone soon uh, to talk about CYP2D6. And, and in the two big studies, the Breast Cancer Prevention Trial, BCPT, which compared tamoxifen to placebo for the prevention of breast cancer, these were not women that had breast cancer. They were high-risk women who were at risk for breast cancer. And STAR, the study of tamoxifen and raloxifen for the prevention of breast cancer, again, 
what we what we see when when some analysis was done is that uh, women that um, had reduced 2C 2D6 activity um, or women who um, were taking drugs that suppressed 2D6 activity um, had uh, reduced response to at least to uh, tamoxifen. Um, those are I think those are a couple of you know concrete examples, and I hope for our questioner that that gives uh, that gives you some idea of of, of that. Um, are we going to get to the point where we're going to be walking around with a our genetic code and uh, our our doctors are going to be able to check that uh, and know what to prescribe for us? Maybe. Um, however, remember that pharmacogenetics is not just genetics, but it's the environment also. Genetics is a good place to start. I think another example of pharmacogenetics and response is when you look at the treatment of acute lymphocytic leukemia in children. We've gone from a cure rate in 60 to 70 percent range to over 90 percent cure rate. And some of that is attributed to better use of 6 mercapropurine or azathioprine in conjunction with genotyping for thiopurine methyltransferase to try to optimize dosing while minimizing toxicity with that drug. Uh, next question, why so little done on phase 2 enzymes consistent uh, versus phase 1? Great question. Um, one of the issues with phase 2 enzymes is that we don't have really good pure probes. We can certainly do genetic uh, research on this and look at genetic patterns and we can do in vitro testing of, uh, of, of those enzymes. But um, there, there aren't uh, slews of drugs that are metabolized only by phase two enzymes. Um, there is some work that's being done with things like valproic acid and things like, um, um, gee, it just jumped out of my mind that uh, New HIV drug that Merck has. Uh, goodness, I can't remember. It is uh, it, it's a deintegrase inhibitor, and pardon me for not remembering its name. Uh, you know, but probably the main reason why so little done in phase two is because we just don't have the in vivo probes uh, to really look at activity specifically of, of phase two enzymes. But there are certainly groups that are working out there. There is a pharmacogenomics group that is a nationwide NIH-funded group, and uh, some of those people are working on transporters, some are working on phase two, some are working on uh, different disease aspects, things like that, uh, receptor polymorphisms, etc. cetera. Um, next question was, how practical is it to be genotyped before receiving a prescription for warfarin? Um, curiously, there's just a, um, a piece in the local paper that suggested that um, I'm sorry, I take that back. There's just a piece in one of the medical journals that looked at um, initial dosing of warfarin and suggested that genotyping initially is, is really about warfarin is that, um, uh, you know, we don't give people loading doses. Um, and usually when we're going to use warfarin on somebody, it's not necessarily an acute situation. The the majority of people that get warfarin in this country for atrial fibrillation, uh, that is generally not an acute situation. So you could genotype someone and then get the genotype results back and start them on warfarin. A little bit different in a hospitalized patient who has a pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis where you uh, have somebody on you know, heparin or a molecular weight heparin or whatever and you want to concurrently start warfarin so that you can send them home on oral therapy rather than on, on injections. Um, in those instances, because you're in the hospital, you can use the biomarker approach. You can check the uh, prothrombin time in the INR, international normalized ratio, to try to help guide your um, guide your therapy. And you could send off your genotype and try to use that later on. But uh, in the hospital, you've got this advantage of being able to check the INR on a regular basis, whereas an outpatient, you have to bring people back and forth uh, to clinic to do that. So um, I think for people that are um, being treated with warfarin for AFib, I think genotyping is probably practical. Now, should you do genotyping? You know, yes, you can do it, but should you do it? And that's a very big controversy. There are groups out there that say, look, we know how to use warfarin. We have warfarin clinics. We have hundreds of people we followed uh, 
in warfarin clinics and we know how to use warfarin. Whereas uh, some, some people on the other side, including the FDA, have said, look, we think that genotyping people can potentially make warfarin safer to use. Um, I don't think that the, the, that the answer is, is in yet. Uh, certainly we're waiting for some cost analysis studies on this and also studies to look and see if we uh, truly get people therapeutic faster, reduce the risk of bleeding complications, et cetera. Um, one of the big groups that's leading the way in this area actually is Merck Medco, um, where, where they are suggesting that people that are going to be on warfarin be genotyped, and they're trying to follow along in terms of uh, outcomes. So um, there's lots more data cooking in the genotyping with warfarin. Um, next one, why only five drugs have genotype in the label? What about the transporters being genotyped? Uh, this is an excellent question. It's a very political question at the FDA. Uh, people in the clinical pharmacology side of the FDA really are pushing for um, label recommendations to actually recommend to do genotyping. If you look at most of the labels now, they're pretty wimpy. Like if you look at the label for atomoxetine, Cytochrome P452D6 genotyping is suggested. It doesn't say, you should do this, you must do this. And, and from what I can tell, one of the reasons is, is because the clinical pharmacologists, I think, have a, a probably a greater sensitivity to, to genotyping, whereas the medical reviewers who make many of the decisions, um, they're not convinced. And there really is a, 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 a real you know, tug of war sometimes going on. Just to give you an example, with warfarin, it took almost five years to, um, to get warfarin relabeled uh, to suggest genotyping. And, uh, you know, it, it's like everything else, unfortunately, in terms of drug development, it gets caught up in the politics of the situation. Uh, transporters being genotyped, uh, we know as little about transporters probably as we do about uh, phase two enzymes. All of my friends who do transporter work would probably uh, stick their tongues out at me at this point and say that's not true. Um, but we've got a long way to go in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, transporters and being genotyped. But just to give you an idea, for example, there are, um, there are certain um, cancer drugs that uh, peak glycoprotein in the central nervous system can uh, prevent from getting into the CNS. And so if you have somebody with a brain tumor and you want to use a, a taxane, taxol on them, uh, that, uh, that is a drug that peak like protein uh, can keep out of the central nervous system. And so in theory, if somebody has very high PGP activity, you'd want to try to inhibit PGP, and you'd like to know that via genotype. Um, so there are people that are working at transporters and trying to bring them into the clinical setting, but again, that, that's sort of going, I think, much slower than the setting from P450s are going. Um, I'm curious about the cost of genetic testing relating to warfarin. Um, the cost varies. It's probably averages around 200 to $250. You do it once. You don't, a person's genotype does not change uh, over their lifetime. Um, and, um, you know, I'm in New York State, and we have a very weird law here where if you're going to genotype somebody, it can only be done by one lab that actually is approved in the state of New York to do it. I think we're the only state in the nation that has this, uh, this odd um, rule. And I don't know why we have this rule, but I'm sure it's got something to do with our fine state legislature. Um, the other part of this question was, are there recognized genotypes for excessive metabolism of warfarin? And the answer is no, but there are recognized genotypes for for uh, the need for excessive doses of warfarin, and that is mediated through receptors, uh, through the vitamin K receptor specifically. There are people, and they fall in the family clusters, that need doses of warfarin that are between five and eightfold greater than the, uh, five and, no, excuse me, five and twentyfold greater than the average dose of warfarin that we use uh, in most people when you look across a population in the warfarin clinic. Uh, so it's not increased metabolism of warfarin, it's reduced sensitivity of the body to warfarin requiring higher doses. Uh, in fact, this is the mechanism of resistance that uh, rodents have, have developed to warfarin, which is why uh, warfarin is not put into, uh, into mouse and rat poison anymore. They use a different Coumadin derivative uh, to uh, 
uh, to avoid uh, the warfarin resistant rats, and that's where it was first described. And remember, we always say it's that uh, rats aren't people, but people can be rats. Um, next question is how does toxicokinetics, drug concentration coupled with pharmacogenetics, gene based? Uh, let me think about how to interpret this question. Um, well, um, what we know is that in an ideal world, the best way to monitor somebody's uh, uh, response to drugs and try to uh, associate it with pharmacokinetics would be to do serum drug concentration monitoring. But for 99% of the drugs that we use, we don't have serum drug concentration monitoring. Um, you know, we know, and I showed you some examples that um, that pharmacogenetics can determine whether people have high exposures to drugs or low exposures to drugs. And certainly, um, there are uh, situations like the back of your example where having a certain genetic type um, doesn't matter probably what your exposure is. If you've got this genetic type, you are at greater risk for life-threatening hypersensitivity reactions. So. I'm not sure that is the question that this person is asking, and if I haven't answered it correctly, please try to clarify for me, and, and I'll try to take another shot at it again. Um, we have uh, some other questions, so while we're waiting. Is there a genetic difference in drug transporters? And the answer is absolutely yes, there is. Um, for P-glycoprotein, for example, we know people can have two active alleles. They can have one active and one uh, reduced or inactive allele, and they can have two inactive alleles or reduced activity alleles. Uh, we, we know less about some of the other transporters in the body. Peak glycoprotein is the most studied transporter currently. Uh, we've got a long way to go in terms of uh, studying uh, uh, transporters, however. Um, the POC, point of care testing, will be the key to integration of the warfarin example as well as others along with extensive physician testing. I guess that that's a comment slash question, and uh, I think that that's absolutely true. Um, many warfarin clinics use point-of-care testing, which means you go in, you get your finger stuck, and uh, oftentimes a nurse or a pharmacist is running that clinic. Um, there are some examples of patients being able to do home testing of INR, and uh, the results get sent over the computer, and dosing recommendations then are, are um, are, are made to made to patients. Um, there are some other weird things about warfarin. You know, people in terms of how they use it, how they tend to dose it. Usually, we only give patients uh, one dose of strength, and giving one dose of strength can be challenging in terms of making dosage adjustments on people. Um, there was a physician from the Mayo Clinic who wrote a piece a number of years ago where he said, "I prescribe two dosage strengths to each of my patients so I can more easily." do dosage adjustments, and I think it makes a, a difference in getting them into the therapeutic range and keeping them uh, out of the toxic range. So we did a study where we looked at uh, the same daily dose versus uh, giving a big dose one day, a smaller dose the next, big, small, that sort of thing. We did a randomized crossover in healthy volunteers to look at INR, and there was no difference. Whether we gave the same dose daily as two different strengths of tablets so that everybody got the same dose every day, or whether we gave a big dose on Monday and reduced the dose by 50% on Tuesday, big dose again on Wednesday, reduced by 50% on, on Thursday, whatever. Um, there was no difference. So, uh, But I would agree with this questioner that point of care testing uh, certainly is, is important. Uh, they've sort of cracked down on pain for point of care testing, unfortunately, in terms of uh, insurance companies and Medicare, things like that. So here's where, once again, where reality meets uh, what is probably better medicine or doesn't meet it. Do we have any other questions? Uh, okay, I don't see any. So uh, with that, I, I want to uh, I want to thank people for attending today and for your participation, and I uh, uh, hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much.